This is an image of the sun generated by uh, NASA and uh, in a very artistic way, combining multiple levels of the infrared spectrum. So these are all images of the sun from different perspectives of the light spectrum uh, combined together. And we're using this as a backdrop for our next conversation, which is the future of energy, the energy transition. And when I was thinking about that topic, which is essential for all of us, I couldn't think of anyone better to address this uh, than a good friend and twinian, Declan Flanagan. If we could have Declan in, I um, know he's all mic'd. Oh, there he is. Hi, Declan. Yeah, by the way, you probably should have used those stairs, but that's okay. Yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> have a seat. So, uh, Declan, you've been busy the past five years or so. Um, yes. Uh, I have had the good fortune of being in the renewables business for about 22 years, but it's interesting yeah. you use five years, because I, 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 it's an industry that changes so rapidly and has changed so rapidly. Yeah. I always say to people uh, in the hiring process, which I'm in the midst of right now, people say, oh, I, I don't know that much about renewables. And Was I that say, a pitch for anybody interested in a job in the renewable yes, industry? Yes, uh, it's yeah. the hardest thing to do in any business, so you have yeah. to pitch whenever you can. Yeah. Uh, and 20 years plus experience feels like sometime a liability in a business yeah, that you, you were in renewables so before it was cool or, or hot or whatever, right? You were in it before. Yes, uh, I had, uh, you know, serendipity, a word you like. Uh, I went to my first uh, wind power conference in Tralee, County Kerry, uh, 22 years ago, and met uh, a well-known entrepreneur, which led to a 22-year journey through two company formations and, and sales um, from Europe to the US, and a stint back in, in Europe again, and uh, investment uh, of billions of dollars in mostly US, a lot of Europe, some, some, uh, some Asia. Um, and being able to look at the energy transition from raising venture capital to sitting on the executive committee of 100 billion uh, market cap companies. So, right, right. So you sold your last company, Lincoln Clean Energy, to Ørsted, the Danish energy company, and they were pretty early in making the transition. You led a division of that, and now you've left that, become an entrepreneur again. So now you've got Blue Star Energy Capital, is that the name of it? Yes. And so you're going to have to explain to everybody why you named this after uh, the airline in the movie Wall Street. <laughs> so it's, it's my six-year-old son's idea. So, uh, okay. People with, with young kids know they, they seem to go on this very you know, predictable path from dinosaurs to stars and yeah. everything yeah. uh, astronomy related. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it had started with, as, as you know, a, a, a term I used to use, uh, dark star, being this unseen gravitational force to restart a new company, uh, which has been a 13 of my career. Uh, but it has a, some sort of ominous connotations. So yeah, my, my not, son- not, not a great term for an energy company, my, dark star energy. My son uh, <laughs> informed me that blue stars are, in, in fact, the hottest stars, and that that was a better better name. Great, but you had no idea, you did not recall that that was the airline that no, Gordon only Gecko people was 53 over. approximately oh, okay, bring that right. up. It, uh, it uh, doesn't, uh, all right, too, it too doesn't say. come up with anyone. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't. 45. Anyway, it's like making Seinfeld quotes to a Gen Zer. Anyway, um, so, so tell, it, tell us about what, what do most people get wrong about the renewable energy transition? What do most people get wrong? I'd say two things. I'd say what most people broadly, and then I think people in a, a room like this, because it's not you know, mo most people. I think most people underestimate the progress that has been made and think we're just starting, when there's been a lot of people, a lot of companies, uh, a Florida company uh, uh, next year has been you know, really moving fast for 20 years in renewables, as an example. Um, and so we've made a lot of progress. If you take Germany, the UK, they've like reduced their, in the last 20 years, their carbon intensity by you know, average 50%. That, that's huge progress. But unfortunately, I think we all underestimate how long the journey, uh, the, how much more of the journey is left. Right. And unfortunately that the point of avoiding trouble is long since passed, and so, when it comes to as you know, so Miami you mean we're, is, we're heading for trouble regardless. It's a matter of navigating through it the best we can. Now. Yes, yes. So there's going to be, you know, uh, uh, I see, you know, some of the more interesting entrepreneurial sort of uh, ventures of people who've been in clean energy for a long time is in climate adoption. 
is that trouble is coming and now what are you going to do to try and manage through right. that trouble? So we've got a long way to go. It's going to take, you know, a lot of, and we'll, we've talked about ESG, ESG bubble, a lot of right. net zero targets, that kind of thing, you know, 2035 and it'll be okay. Or, you know, right. uh, if, uh, a book that uh, just came out, uh, uh, Vaclav um, Slim uh, or Smil uh, uh, talks about why, why do companies all pick years that end in five or zero for their net zero uh, target? It shows there's uh, quite a bit of branding going on. Yeah. And I think it's obfuscating the fact that trouble is staring us in the face. It's, yeah. And it's now unavoidable. So yeah. there's a, a lot of progress has been made. A lot of tools are there, but we're not going to get through this without uh, the energy transition, without trouble increased cost, uh, you're still going to have, you know, the, the weather events, etc. You're going to have supply chain issues, you're going to have quality of life issues you're right. seeing in Europe right now. So, but, a, uh, but a key, and you and I talked about this a bit, is, that tra is, is energy storage. When we can figure out storage, that is a key that unlocks a lot of the solutions. So where, where are we in that trajectory right now? Well, I would say one of the things that's consistently surprised me over 20 years in this business is uh, solving technical problems that people think are, you know, won't be solved, uh, but uh, uh, get solved, uh, and storage is one of them. Uh, uh, economically viable storage and a range of options, lithium ion batteries get the, the most attention, but there's tons of work happening across different uh, uh, forms of battery storage. And the issue comes into supply chain and all this metals and stuff that gets a lot of uh, coverage. So the storage grid integration, that's, you know, one of the things, another thing people get wrong is this idea, oh, the wind doesn't blow, what happens when the sun goes down? Power systems all over the world have managed, they've been saying this for 20 years, that, oh, we can only get to 5%, we get to 5% and it's fine. We can only get to 10%, we yeah. get to 10% and it's fine. There's a lot of, and there's, we could get quickly uh, into the weeds and out of, out of my depth on this, but it's not as big of a problem as people perceive. Uh, the problem with storage is just going to be ramping up the production of the batteries. Right, right, right. But the technology is there. Right, so the progress that's been made now compared to 22 years ago, those startup challengers, the little scrappy challengers, some of them are now the incumbents. And you were saying that there's been a transition problem for some of these uh, new energy challengers who've now become incumbents. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I would say yeah, this is an extraordinarily capital intensive business. So it's not that the challengers, in most instances, have become incumbents. They've been acquired by incumbents mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, been happily involved in some of that. What, um, so now I'll date myself as any West Wing fans in, 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 in the room. There, there was an episode of the West Wing where they want to get the renewable energy industry together. And it was really well researched because it ended up in chaos of hydropower guys fighting with wind power guys, fighting with solar power guys, and rooftop <laughs> solar power guys fighting with utility. And this is, I think, that line that's, I, I think, inaccurately uh, attributed to Henry Kissinger, that if I want to call Europe, who do I call? It's a problem in the renewables business. So if I want to speak to renewables, who do I call? The oil industry doesn't have that problem. You know, even people who don't like the oil industry trust it to be there when they need it, because they don't think about it. Mm. But people perceive wind, solar, not so sure that it's going to keep the lights on. So there's a sort of a, a status, a stature sort of problem. Yeah. And in part, it's due to the fractured nature of it's not an industry that speaks at one, one voice. This progress, I was on the board of the American Clean Power Association, the, used to be the American Wind Power Association, so you can see we're trying to coalesce, but it is an industry that does still suffer. It's uh, uh, interesting, the journey of Miami from low self-confidence to high self-confidence. I think Chicago still struggles in that yeah. uh, journey. Yeah. The renewables industry really struggles with that. You know, ultimately, the oil industry has more confidence. Well, they've been at it a lot longer, but you, we talked uh, before the session about the analog to the tech industry for a number of years would kind of hang out in Silicon Valley and say, well, we don't have to be involved in government and we're not gonna, you know, ignore, we're gonna ignore those people and create our value and save the world. And, and renewables kind of were doing that because they're the good guys, right? And, but they've got to mature past that. Yes. This gets into another common misperception is one I'd say would apply in a room like this, is the perception of the aggregate return on capital in renewables. If I bet if we did one of those little polls, 
people would overestimate. You know, there's, there's pockets of the business that are very uh, 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 lucrative, but on aggregate, the return on capital in renewables compared to the tech industry, there's just no comparison. Yeah. And that's the sad reality of politics in the US and globally, but particularly in the US, you have to spend a lot of money. And so you look at what the tech companies have spent versus what the renewables industry has spent. Yeah. It's, and and that's there's, there's just an affordability, you know? So this is part, I'm not, uh, you'd rather change the dynamic that money talks, <laughs> but in the, that's one of the challenges. The aggregate return on capital in the, in the heavy, massive capex, because bear in mind the renewables, all your capex is up front. The fuel is free, but all the capex is up front. So the, it's not as profitable as the tech business. So the tech business, when they had a problem, they, they hired ex-chancellors yeah. of the exchequer of the right. UK, speechwriters for Barack Obama. Those guys don't get hired in the renewables business. Right, right. Uh, so there's a, a, a... But the industry has to figure out how to stand up for itself, how to engage, how to uh, unfortunately play that political game better. Uh, and uh, by the way, it wasn't always like that in the tech industry. As, as I said, for many years, they sat back and said, we're going to ignore government because we're just going to go be great people and everybody's going to love us. That changed over the past 10 or 15 years. Renewables has to go through a similar kind of transition. Yes, that's why the representative organizations are so important and the industry has been trying to, to head in the direction of a more unified voice and stop the, you know, but you've seen this in, uh, it's been in Florida the last number of years, the solar rooftop guys fighting with everybody else. Uh, 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 there's a lot of fractures. I think it also falls on the large companies that have met it through the, through the gap. And I think, you know, uh, my former boss, uh, CEO of, of Orsted is, is really, uh, who just joined six months before I left last year, being more front and center of the global debate, you know, that uh, you need to be in a situation that if, uh, I always use the point, uh, she's now retired, but if Angela Merkel wants to talk about energy, there should be no question in her mind or advisor's mind, who's the first person you call, you know? Right. And historically, it would have been the CEO of ExxonMobil or CEO of BP. And you need to change that, 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 that there are, uh, uh, and, and it's, a multifaceted you know, journey, but yeah, I think that large companies are beginning to step up, but they have to, to, have to step right. up. So Declan, what's one thing that we here in the United States should do differently, better, in order to better conquer this energy transition? What's one thing you recommend somebody somewhere do? The, uh, it's quite in, in the details of the business, uh, unfortunately, but you know, all of our uh, uh, electricity markets are not designed for the world that we need to live in. You know, we have got lucky. You know, I always think of, I like, give the scorecard of the last 20 years. The engineers get an A. They have done a fantastic job of bringing forward the technology. The financiers get a C. It's boom and bust. It's like ESG, everyone wants to invest. 10 years ago, no one wants to invest. And, and now they've overinflated their values, and so they'll come down, and people won't want to invest again. So that it's volatile. Politicians get a C because it's on again, off again. And regulators have got lucky, but their luck is running out in terms of market. You saw that in Texas last year. That uh, okay? So give the regulators a grade. You're on camera. Uh, I would say <laughs> uh, you, you're, you're getting a B because you're lucky because okay. nothing has broken yet. But you've got okay. lucky that. No one realized all of these power systems that were not designed for renewables actually are working quite well. There's elements of why that is that to do with low interest rates, ESG booms, and a little bit of ill discipline on generators. But uh, we've got to get uh, a lot of hard work. What happened in Texas last year uh, was a market design failure uh, in, in, in February, uh, and people died as a result. You yeah. know? So it's really yeah. serious when it, go, when it goes yeah. wrong. You know? Um, and part of it is you need to pay more, unfortunately. It seems odd to say today, for energy, you need to pay more. This year, the world will spend 13% of GDP on energy, which is way too much. It's like three times what is spent on education. That's insane. Why is that? Because for the last 10 years, it's spent five, five and a half, six percent 6% of GDP. That's too little. So we were got complacent on cheap electricity. We paid too little for electricity. We paid too much to deliver it and too little for the generation. That's part of uh, a regulatory failure. Um, so what do we need to do in the US? We need to accept this is going to be a painful transition. It's going to involve a lot of investment and tackling some, some hard choices around permitting, building of a, a power grid. Because really, decarbonization really means electrification. 
right. uh, and, and that's going to involve uh, some you know, uh, difficult, uh, difficult choices. Well, speaking of investments, uh, who, who's, who are the publicly traded entities that you think are doing interesting things that, that you'd keep an eye on if you were us? Well, I'm reading a book right now, Skin in the Game, you know, the guy who wrote Black Swan. And so oh, yeah. he makes a point that you know, when you I've ask someone that question, you, know, you should ask, what do they own? So, uh, okay, what do you own? Uh, so uh, Next Era Energy here in Florida has been a leader in the energy transition right. for 20 years when absolutely no other power company had an interest in renewables. They were investing. Uh, and there's no one in the industry who's not a big respecter of them. They can be a, a tough competitor, but they, the results speak for themselves. I think Orsted, uh, my former company, uh, and I still happily own uh, shares in, they created the offshore wind industry. When people like me, I was involved in my first offshore wind project in Ireland in 2001, 2002. And I have to say, I didn't really believe this was going to work. You know, we're, we're going into you know, 100 feet of water and putting turbines uh, in it uh, and, and in a harsh environment, anyone who's done anything in ocean engineering. And uh, they figured it out. Not only has it worked, it's now 100 miles offshore UK, you have two gigawatt wind farms, and they've bought down the cost. And really, the, a lot of credit goes to policymakers in the UK, but Orsted really created that, uh, that business. And it's now um, going to be a huge card in getting off Russian gas, which we, of course, should have got off 20 years right. ago. It's not everyone knew that was a bad idea. But offshore wind in Europe, is a viable choice now because of the actions of, of Orsted. So is there anything coming in the next couple of years that we as non-energy experts should be keeping an eye on that you say this, this is a harbinger of things to come or this is a pivot point that we're heading toward? Anything we should keep an eye on? Um, you're going to have more power cuts than uh, you know, historically because of uh, underinvestment in the grid in most places in, in the country combined with uh, more storms. Uh, uh, and you're going to want to resist the natural urge to buy a backup generator that's going to run a natural gas is going to exacerbate it. That it's going to be a rocky rut. I, there's, there's no way around that. This energy transition is not, and I think that's one of the sort of problems I've had with the ESG bubble is this idea that, you know, we're all going to be profitable and good at the same time and it's all going to be fine. has obscured the fact there is trouble, you know. And there's going to be a cost. And you're going to have less reliable and more expensive service for a while until we get through the other side. But that's not 10, 10 years away. That's 20 plus years away. Well, so Declan, on that happy note, I'll ask you uh, one, one last question. Uh, Three words to describe how you feel about the future energy transition. And don't explain the words, just three words to describe how you feel about uh, coming energy transition. But it's broadening. Okay, it's, that's it. All right, no. Oh, broadening. Okay, good. Broadening, deepening, and accelerating. Yeah. Broadening, deepening, and accelerating. Great. Uh, Declan, we got the report card. Engineers, A. Financiers, C. Politicians, a generous C. Regulators, a lucky B. Thanks for taking a dark star and turning it into a blue star. Maybe I should thank your son for doing that. And thanks for being an energy star, Declan. Thanks, Good job. Good time.